This edition of Space Time is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash space time. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or your MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com forward slash space time for your free audiobook. This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 8 for broadcast on the 27th of January, 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audioboom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, discovery of one of the brightest distant galaxies ever seen, the new project looking for exoplanets next door, and crash and burn as Japan loses an experimental scientific satellite during launch. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have detected one of the brightest galaxies ever seen in the distant universe. A report in the Astrophysical Journal claims the galaxy, known as BG 1429 plus 1202, was discovered some 11.4 billion light-years away, which is around four-fifths of the way back to the very beginning of the universe. The discovery is all thanks to a process known as gravitational lensing. First predicted by Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, gravitational lensing occurs when light from a distant background object, such as a galaxy, is bent and magnified by the gravity of a massive foreground object, such as another large galaxy or galaxy cluster. This bending of light, by the effect of mass on the fabric of space-time, causes an apparent increase in the brightness of the background object, thereby allowing astronomers to see it. The detection of BG 1429 plus 1202 was made possible by the help of a massive elliptical foreground galaxy. The foreground galaxy is located some 5.4 billion light years away and directly along the line of sight to the more distant background galaxy. The foreground elliptical galaxy acted as a kind of lens amplifying BG 1429 plus 1202's brightness and allowing astronomers to see details which would otherwise be far too faint to detect. And by the way, that name, BG1429 plus 1202, well, that's sort of like the galaxy's address, its location in the sky as seen from Earth. Those with a plus sign are located in the northern celestial hemisphere, while those with a negative sign are located in the southern celestial hemisphere. The study's lead author, Rue Marquez Chavez, from the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canary Islands, says this is one of the few known cases of a galaxy with both a very high apparent brightness and also an intrinsically high luminosity. The observations have allowed the team to determine the galaxy's key properties over a very short time scale. In point, the authors were able to examine the extremely bright Lyman alpha radiation being emitted by the galaxy. Lyman alpha is a spectral line emitted by electrons falling from the N2 orbital to the N1 orbital, usually in hydrogen atoms. The lensing galaxy produced four distinct images of BG 1429 plus 1202, with a flux some nine times bigger than would be possible without the gravitational lensing effect. An exceptional characteristic of this galaxy was its extremely high luminosity in the Lyman alpha emission line, one of the brightest in the ultraviolet range. Other similar cases of lens galaxies usually don't show such strong emission in this line. Although the gravitational lensing effect has been used many times before in other research projects, it's the first time the method of selecting distant Lima alpha emitting galaxies has been used in this specific project, which is based on the analysis of spectra from 1.5 million galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey at the Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. The increase in the apparent brightness as observed from Earth all thanks to the gravitational lensing of the distant galaxy, has allowed astronomers to obtain data of improved quality. In fact, discoveries like BG 1429 plus 1202 demonstrate the way in which big astronomy data sets from large surveys can be mined for new astrophysical applications. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
cosmologists trying to understand how to unite two pillars of modern science, namely quantum physics and gravity, have found a new way to make robust predictions about the effect of quantum fluctuations on primordial density waves, which is sort of like ripples in the very fabric of space-time. Scientists have found quantum imprints left on cosmological structures in the very early universe, and this has begun shedding light on what we could expect from a full quantum theory of gravity. One of the study's authors, Dr. Vincent Vinnan from the University of Portsmouth, says while they haven't solved quantum gravity just yet, they have learnt a little bit more about how it should work. Physicists don't yet know how to combine theories of gravity and the quantum world. Both are known to play a crucial role in the very early universe, where the expansion of space-time is driven by gravity and cosmological structures that arise from quantum fluctuations. In fact, quantum fluctuations during a mysterious period called inflation, which happened moments after the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, are thought to be the origin of all structure in the universe. Consequently, structures we see in the universe today, in the form of galaxies, stars, planets and, yes, even people, can all be traced back to these primordial fluctuations. Quantum gravity is a field of theoretical physics designed to describe gravity according to the principles of quantum mechanics. That's because in the real world, quantum effects simply can't be ignored. Our understanding of gravity is based on Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is formulated within the framework of classical physics. However, the non-gravitational forces, such as electromagnetism and the large and small nuclear forces, are all described within the framework of quantum mechanics, a radically different formulism for describing physical phenomena based on the wave-like nature of matter. The need to develop a quantum mechanical description of gravity is based on the fact that you simply can't couple a classical system to a quantum one. Put simply, general relativity, which explains the universe on the cosmic scale, and quantum physics, which explains it on the subatomic scale, simply don't speak the same language. So, while a quantum theory of gravity is needed to reconcile general relativity with the principles of quantum mechanics, problems arise when scientists try to apply quantum field theory to the force of gravity using things like graviton bosons, theoretical particles of force which are yet to be discovered. The problem is that the theory one gets in this way simply is not renormalizable, therefore it can't be used to make meaningful physical predictions. Because of this, theorists have taken up some more radical approaches to the problem of quantum gravity, the most popular being string theory, although that's got its own problems, such as the need for additional dimensions. And depending on which flavour of string theory you're into, that could mean 19, 21 or even 23 different dimensions. A recent development is the hypothesis of causal fermion systems, which gives quantum mechanics, general relativity and quantum field theory as limiting cases. Of course, quantum gravity is really only meant to describe the quantum behaviour of a gravitational field. And while some quantum gravity theories, such as string theory, try to unify gravity with the other fundamental forces, other theories, such as loop quantum gravity, make no such attempt. Instead, loop quantum gravity quantizes the gravitational field, while still keeping it separate from the other forces. A more fundamental problem, one which not even Albert Einstein could solve before his passing, was the unification of all fundamental interactions into a single mathematical framework. Any improvement in understanding quantum gravity would help scientists working to develop this unified theory. A theory of quantum gravity, which is also part of a grand unification of all known interactions, is called the theory of everything. Of course, the biggest stumbling block in trying to understand quantum gravity is that quantum gravitational effects are only expected to become apparent near the Planck scale, a scale far smaller in distance and consequently far larger in energy than what science's most powerful particle accelerators can currently achieve. So for now at least, quantum gravity remains a primarily theoretical enterprise, although there is speculation about just how quantum gravitational effects might be detected in existing experiments at places like CERN. Of course, another view of general relativity is that gravity may not be a force at all. In reality, it may simply be the effect mass has on the very fabric of space-time. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. OK, let's take a break from the show and talk about one of our sponsors. Audible's offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial to give you an opportunity to check out their service. Audible have over 180,000 different titles to choose from, such as Contact by Carl Sagan or A Brief History in Time by Stephen Hawking. Others include the unabridged version of The Hobbit by R.R. R. Tolkien, Divergent by Veronica Roth, and Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen. So many great books, no matter what your taste. Over 180,000 titles to choose from. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime. 
That's audibletrial.com forward slash space time for your free audiobook. Or you can click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com. And now, back to our show. Astronomers are about to begin a new project searching for planets in our nearest neighbouring star system, Alpha Centauri. The new search is the latest in the Breakthrough Foundation initiative funded by Russian physicist Yuri Milner and British scientist Stephen Hawking. The Foundation is already running two other major projects. One of them, which we mentioned here on Space Time a few weeks ago, is the Breakthrough Listen project. It's designed to search for potential radio signals from extraterrestrial intelligence sources throughout the universe using dishes like the Parkes Radio Telescope. The other project is Breakthrough Starshot, a $100 million program designed to develop a swarm of small spacecraft, each fitted with a giant cell propelled by lasers, which will travel to the Alpha Centauri star system. The tiny spacecraft known as Starships will each only be a few centimetres long, but their laser-powered sails should accelerate them to within 20% of the speed of light. That's fast enough to reach the Alpha Centauri system in just 20 to 30 years, in other words, within our lifetimes. The new breakthrough project involves equipping one of the four 8.2-metre optical telescopes, which comprise the European Southern Observatory's VLT, or Very Large Telescope, in Chile, to search for nearby exoplanets in the Alpha Centauri triple star system. Astronomers have already discovered one planet there, an Earth-sized terrestrial world known as Proxima b, which is orbiting in the habitable zone of the star Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is a spectral type M red dwarf star, which orbits the other two stars in the system, Alpha Centauri A and B. At a distance of just 4.3 light years, Proxima Centauri is the nearest star to the Earth other than the Sun. By the way, the habitable or Goldilocks zone is the region around a star where temperatures are not too hot and not too cold, but just right to allow liquid water, essential for life as we know it, to pool on an orbiting planet's surface. To find out more about the latest Breakthrough Project initiative, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. The Breakthrough Foundation has actually signed an agreement with the European Southern Observatory to adapt the instrumentation on one of the very large telescopes to look for planets specifically in the nearby star system of Alpha Centauri. That's the nearest star system to our own. It consists of multiple stars, of which the nearest is a little red dwarf called Proxima Centauri. It's 4.3 light years away. We already know that Proxima has a planet-sized object in orbit around it. Mm. So the idea with this deal is that there'll be an adaptation of some of the instruments on one or more of these very large telescopes to actually look specifically for other planets around the stars of the Alpha Centauri system. And that is because in the long term, the Breakthrough Foundation actually wants to send a spacecraft to this star system. Now, you, uh, and, I, you and I have talked about going there before with these miniature spacecraft that are, right, that are pushed yes. along by laser. Is that what they're talking about? Yeah, that's right. The, mm. the Breakthrough Starshot program. So you push them along with a laser. They get up to something like 20% of the speed of light. That means that you can do the trip in 20 or 30 years rather than 100,000 years with conventional technology. So really very, very interesting in terms of what this is all about. The problem, uh, Andrew, with, uh, with detecting the planets of other stars is that stars are very bright and the planets shine by reflected light. So that means they're not very bright. And mm. people have likened it to trying to find the glow of a lighthouse keeper's cigarette on the gantry right next to the beam of a lighthouse. Uh, it's that sort of thing. It's actually billions of times more faint is the planet. However, you can improve your chances by looking in the infrared region of the spectrum. That's where you know, you're looking at radiation that's redder than red. And so that is what is happening with this project. They are actually modifying some infrared in instrumentations uh, instrumentation on the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, with the hope of investigating planets near to the already known one around Proxima Centauri, but also perhaps around the two remaining components of Alpha Centauri as well. So very interesting stuff. I think they're planning to start work on the search program in 2019. It'll probably take them that long to actually do the modifications to the instruments. Okay. And then ultimately, if they find some planets there that 
uh, and and they may well do that, uh, that are uh, interesting enough, we will possibly send a, a, a space craft to the area or more exactly. than one. I think they were talking about sending multiples, weren't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you blast them all with the same laser. Mm. Um, and that might be the case. You know, the technology that would be required to do that doesn't really exist at the moment, but it, it can be, you know, you can visualize how it would work. It's not uh, it's not new physics or anything impossible. It's just an adaptation of modern technology, the current technology. It's, so, not, it's not rocket science, you're saying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, it's not rocket science because they don't use rockets. Yeah. They're using these solar sails. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Very All good. right. Well, we'll watch that one with interest because that's a story that you know, could evolve uh, for several years to come and uh, really be worth pursuing because being able to send spacecraft so far in such a short period of time is um, ultimately the goal, but it would also be one, one great achievement uh, worth uh, worth keeping an eye on. Exactly, yeah. It could be, uh, you know, the, almost the biggest experiment in the history of humanity. That's Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program Space Nuts. And I'm Stuart Gary, and this is Space Time. JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, has lost a small scientific satellite when the launch vehicle crashed and burned during ascent. The SS-520-4 rocket's mission had already been delayed by more than a day due to strong winds at its Uchinora Space Center in southern Japan. The 10-meter-tall SS-520-4 launch vehicle is based on a two-stage solid-fuel-powered sounding rocket, with a third solid-fuel stage added for the mission. Mission managers say all communications with the rocket were lost after the first stage completed its 31-second engine burn. The flight was designed to test a potential new launch vehicle specifically designed for CubeSat missions. Had the mission continued, the rocket's second stage would have fired for 24 seconds, followed by a 26-second ignition from the third stage, enough to take the satellite payload into a low-Earth elliptical orbit, ranging in altitude from 180 to 1,500 kilometres. The payload for the mission was the 3-kilogram Tricom-1 CubeSat, an Earth observation satellite built by students from the University of Tokyo. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And finally for now, the February issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine has just hit the newsstands. Joining us now with the details of this month's issue is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. Yeah, so Stuart, in the, in the February issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, and the cover story, in fact, is we take a really in-depth look at China's mega new radio telescope dish. It's called FAST, which stands for the 500-metre Aperture Spherical Radio Telescope, and it is one amazing piece of engineering. It took them five and a half years to build this, and because it's 500 metres wide, a radio dish 500 metres wide, they actually built it in a valley. Okay, this has been done before, but not on this scale. Yeah, that was Arecibo you're talking about, yeah. Arecibo in Puerto Rico, yeah, uh, which has been around for quite a long time now. But it did star in one of the James Bond movies. Oh, well, there you go. Well, in that case, it's only a matter of time before... uh, this one in China, or will they let that there? Because it's probably some rotten imperialist capitalist... Uh, oh, they're pretty uh, good with that MI, sort of thing. They don't mind promoting themselves. Anyway, to build this thing in this valley, they have to dig out almost a million cubic metres of rock, or dig and blast, I presume. And because they get a lot of rain, of course, um, they didn't want the thing to get flooded away, they built a kilometre-long drainage channel to accommodate all the heavy rainfall. The dish itself is made up of about 4,500 panels all joined together. There are almost 9,000 thick steel cables holding it in place. And all these little individual segments of the dish are individually controlled so they can keep their shape. It's just really quite staggering technology, including, like all radio telescopes, it has radio receivers instead of cameras. And the main radio receiver technology has been supplied by none other than Australia's very own CSIRO. In fact, the Aussies are the best of the world at building this particular kind of gear. Yeah, that enables radio telescopes to scan wide ranges of frequencies and lots of the sky at the same time. So what will FAST do, this 500-metre telescope? Well, I expect 
that it's going to discover hundreds and hundreds of new pulsars in our galaxy and ones outside our galaxy and other galaxies as well. Going to map lots of gas clouds in our galaxies and other galaxies, all sorts of things. And it will be even be used, or, or at least it's capable of being used, to listen for faint radio signals from any extraterrestrial civilizations that might be out there. So watch this space for the uh, fast telescope in China. Now also in the February issue is an article on Supernova 1987A. I think we might have spoken about this um, before on the program. This was an exploding star that was spotted in the southern skies back in 1987, although it had actually exploded more than 100,000 years earlier in another galaxy. It had just taken that long for the light to reach us. Um, now this was the brightest supernova discovered in 400 years. You could see it with the naked eye. I went out and saw it. I remember seeing it. I remember going out in my balcony looking at this. just looked like a star in the night sky, but it wasn't there the night before. Uh, you know, the, the last time that happened, 400 or roughly 400 years ago, the telescope hadn't even been invented. So as you can imagine, there was great excitement in the scientific world and every astronomer and his dog uh, went out and, and uh, had a look at this thing and turned every telescope they could onto it to um, grab this opportunity because it could be another 400 years before it happens again. I remember I was working at a commercial radio station in Darwin in the Northern Territory at the time and that just uh, it just blew my mind away when I read that article. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. Oh. It totally took me away. Yeah, well, this is the thing. I mean, the sky seems so unchanging they don't really seem to change much from night to night but when something like this goes off you, you realize that things are changing out there in the universe and we just need to look for it so even now 30 years later astronomers are still keeping an eye on this supernova or the supernova remnant as we should say they're looking to see what happens after a supernova occurs and in particular one of the things they want to know is whether the exploded star turned into a neutron star or even a black hole theory says a neutron star should probably have formed but there's been no sign of it so far so uh, they're carrying on looking for that and other things there I assume that the astronomers think that the neutron star Pulsar may well be hidden by a thick cloud of dust and debris because the supernova remnant from that star has formed an hourglass shape and that hourglass shape is very characteristic of dense material around the equatorial region of the star preventing the blast going out evenly in all directions and so it's possible the neutron star is there if it is a neutron star but still hidden by the uh, dust and debris around the middle of the star. It's entirely possible yeah that it could be hidden because with a neutron star um, a neutron star is a spinning pulsar and it sends out radio waves in particular, very particular directions, beams in particular directions, like a lighthouse. So if it's not pointed in exactly in your direction or if something is blocking it in exactly your direction, then you're not going to see it. So in, in a sense, you have to be lucky. Anyway, we'll see what happens with Supernova 1987A. 30 years later, they're still studying it. So uh, it, it's really quite an interesting story, that, and, and particularly for those people like myself who were around at that time and are now old, but can still remember it. So yeah, if, if you do remember 1987A, we've got a really good story about that in the uh, February issue of the magazine. We also have a test report we put three inexpensive tabletop telescopes to the test. Now, what's a tabletop telescope? Well, a tabletop telescope is one where you don't need a big tripod, you don't need to take it outside. It's just a little scope, and you can just stand it on, on your desk or your table. If you're on a budget or you don't have a backyard, you can just get one of these scopes, literally stick it on a table next to an open window, and point it outside and start stargazing. They are really, really good. They're not, not expensive. They don't do everything that bigger telescopes can do, of course, but as starter scopes, they're really, really good. And these particular ones are a brand called Mead, and the telescopes are called Light Bridge Minis, and they come in three different sizes. And our reviewer found that they're actually really good value, and they give good views of planets and the moon, that kind of thing, uh, for, for small telescopes. They're a good starter scope to get into uh, astronomy. So what sort of money are we talking about for one of these starter telescopes? Not much money at all, in fact. Um, I mean, these are small telescopes, so you know, don't expect something huge that would be in a big observatory. But the, little, the smallest one, the Light Bridge Mini 82, well, the US price is 59 bucks. Mind you, it is a small, it's a small scope. It's a good one for a kid. It's a, it's a small telescope. But the Lightbridge Mini 114, you know, 114 means it's got a 114 millimeter aperture, which is about four inches, which is pretty good. That's only $150 US. And the larger one, the Lightbridge Mini 130, 130 mils, that's about, uh, what, uh, five inches across. It's only 199. How does that compare with some of the bigger telescopes that we see for backyard domestic use? I'm not talking about the VLT here. <laughs> oh, look, um, how long is a piece of string? Uh, with, with other telescopes, larger ones with uh, on bigger tripods or different kinds of mounts, you can be anything from five or $600 up to thousands. But, you know, you get what you pay for. These little tabletop scopes are good beginner scopes. The bigger ones, they come with all sorts of bells and whistles. They have different kind of mounting systems, which mean you can do different things, you can attach cameras more easily. A lot of them have computerization systems. So uh, they, they come standard with computers, basically. So you've got a little hand controller and you say, OK, I want to see uh, XYZ. So you type XYZ in and the telescope just goes with its motors and points you exactly at XYZ. 
when these things first started coming out about 20 years ago, all the astronomy purists said, oh, no, I don't like that, you know, that's not real astronomy, but letting the telescope find the things for you, you've got to go out there and find them yourselves. But I think that has largely dissipated because you get so much more done with a computerised telescope, if you can you know, afford to get one, because, you know, you don't have all that wasted time trying to find things in the night sky. You just tell it well, what I want to see. It automatically swings to it and then you get stuck into whatever you want to do, whether it's just having a look or if you're taking photos or whether you're doing some of the scientific programs that amateur astronomers can do. So look, it's how long is a piece of string when it comes to telescopes and it's horses for courses. Different telescopes are best for some things, like some telescopes are great for planets, other types of telescopes are great for looking at galaxies, some telescopes are sort of all-rounders, they can do a bit of everything. These ones, the Mead Lightbridge Minis, are really good little scopes for a kid or an introductory scope to get yourself started and particularly, as I say, if you're um, in a location where you, know, you can't stick a telescope up in the backyard or something, but you can point something out of a window. Or On a balcony. the other good thing about these ones, the balcony, or, you know, they're so small and light and portable, you can take them with you if you're going on holidays. You know, if you're going camping or something, just take them with you. So um, the, that's the Mead Light Bridge. There are, there are other brands too, and not particularly pushing Mead. There are plenty of other brands around that have similar sorts of scopes. So um, yeah, check them out. They're really, really good. If you're in the market for a telescope and you don't have a huge budget, but you just want to get started, something like this might be right for you. That's Jonathan Nally the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe.